Hello, I'm Olivia, um, and I serve on the communion team and as a GC leader. Today, we'll be reading from Genesis 45, 1 through 8. Um, so please open your Bible with me, and if you do not have one, there's one in the seat pocket in front of you. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. He cried, make everyone go out for me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph, is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. So Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near. And he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler of, over all the land of Egypt. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Olivia. Church family, man, we have come to a very powerful section in the book of Genesis, maybe what some would call the climactic portion in this Joseph narrative. And so if you're not there already, Genesis 45 Genesis 45, and again, if I haven't had the chance to meet you, my name is Shay Sumlin. I'm one of the pastors here at Northway, and grateful to be with you. We've been in the book of Genesis for two years. Uh, we have three weeks left after this week, but two years, and let me summarize it in about 30 seconds. The greater story of Genesis is tracing God's redemptive plan to undo sin's curse. All that had been wrecked in humanity through sin in Genesis chapter three, God has a plan, has a purpose, and has made promises towards it to bring about redemption by bringing forth a savior, a savior named Jesus Christ, who is to redeem all that sin has done. And what we've been doing is tracing that plan through various families, and we've been zeroing in the latter portion of Genesis on the family of Jacob. God has got to do a work in order to bring forth that savior through this family with Jacob and particularly his 12 sons. And the horrific story that we saw began with, out of those 12 sons, 10 of them selling the youngest brother out to slavery. Joseph, the youngest brother at the time, had a dream. He was 17 years old about how God was going to elevate him, and his brothers were jealous. They didn't like it, and so they took him, and they sold him into slavery, and they took him down to Egypt, and then led their father to believe that Joseph was dead, that an animal had tore him to pieces. And so he goes and he will spend the next 13 years in captivity in Egypt, most of that in a prison. And where it seems like everybody had forgotten about him, God had not. Because God mysteriously was actually using all these horrific events to orchestrate something powerful for the redemption of one particular family. And so sure enough, while in prison, Joseph gets asked, this Hebrew slave, to to interpret the dreams of Pharaoh, which had to do about a famine that was coming. And this Hebrew slave interprets them, saving them from the near famine that's gonna come, designs a plan to help preserve life in the midst of that famine. And so Joseph gets elevated to the second highest in command, the prince of Egypt. And so time is now passed and famine is now hit just as the dream uh, prophesied would and sure enough, Joseph's brothers are sent from Canaan into Egypt to buy grain. And they encounter Joseph in chapter 42 through 44, as we read last week. And what Joseph does, and the first time in seeing his brothers in 20 years at this point, he's going to set up two tests to see have these brothers changed at all in the last 20 years? Have they repented? And through a series of those tests, Joseph finds out they have. And it culminated last week in chapter 44, where the test is, would they sell out another brother, the youngest now, Benjamin? And Judah, the very one who sold Joseph into slavery, steps up and says, don't take his life, take mine. And he offers to substitute his life. 
in exchange so that Benjamin can go free. Now, this scene was so powerful because what we see Joseph, all Joseph ever wanted was not wrath and judgment for his brothers. All Joseph ever wanted was for their repentance and for them to turn unto him and and to receive and to give them grace and forgiveness. And so in this moment when Judah has offered the greatest act to substitute himself, which was a foreshadow of Judah's descendant, Jesus Christ, who would offer himself as a substitute for us so that we can go free, Joseph cannot take any more. And so look with me here, starting again in verse one of chapter 45. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried, make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. Such an intimate moment here. Everybody out of the room, just me and them. And he wept so loud that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. This is third time Joseph has now wept. And this time it's so loud. Pharaoh's in another room going, what's that? What's going on? He's crying so hard. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. There's such a powerful moment here, y'all. I've been waiting for this climactic moment since chapter 37. And just seeing here Joseph, his heart just burst. When he sees Judah offer himself, his heart just bursts uncontrollably. And note the first two things that come out of his mouth. I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? You know, interestingly enough, stories have shown that long-term kidnapped victims, when they are found, those are the first two statements that come out of their mouth. A statement of identity and a statement of desire. I'm the one you've been looking for. I am he. And then, are my parents okay? In in many ways, this is showing the primal desire that has occupied Joseph's heart for the last 20 years. It's the third time he asks these brothers, is is, is your father still alive? Now it's, is my dad still alive? Is Jacob okay? He loves his father so much. It's all he could think about for the last 20 years. Meanwhile, his brothers, they can't even acknowledge, they can't even respond because they're just going, what just happened? That's Joseph? Like their minds can't even comprehend. They've been talking to the prince of Egypt here and all of a sudden he drops it. No more translation, pull off the the mask. It's it's me, it's Joseph. And, And they just cannot even believe it. Now what you would expect in this moment from a hurt and wounded victim of trauma and abuse who is now in a position of power over the very ones who originally were in power over him, what would you expect would come out of this guy 20 years later? You might expect, and maybe even they were expecting in this moment, like here comes 20 years of stored up wrath and anger and vindictive judgment that is about to happen to them. Off to the gallows with your heads. That's not what happens. Notice what Joseph does. First of all, in verse four, Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near. This is an invitation to intimacy with him. Again, no more Egyptian disguise here, no more translators, no more distance, no more testing. Just unveiled intimacy, welcoming them back into his presence. This is the beginning of forgiveness and reconciliation. What follows is not 20 years of stored up bitterness. What follows is not 20 years of vaulted wrath about to be unleashed. What follows next is an offer of mercy, forgiveness, and reconciliation. Look at this at the end of verse four. And he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. 
But now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. And what a powerful statement. In other words, you don't need to beat yourself up anymore. You, you don't need to live one more moment from this point forward in undue shame. You have already owned your guilt. You have already repented. You have already shown restitution and willing to substitute your life. The debt's canceled. That's all I ever needed to see. I forgive you. And here's why. Notice the juxtaposition in what Joseph just said. These two statements, feel the tension. You sold me, but God sent me. You sold me, but God sent me. Joseph isn't excusing their sin or injustice, but instead he's framing it in the context of the greater theological perspective that is at play in the midst of all these sufferings. What they did was wrong, yes, but what God was doing in it all along that took a lot of time for Joseph to be able to see, said, God, it was actually all part of God's plan. Now, God is not the author of evil. They are the author. You sold me in evil. He didn't say God sold me in Egypt. You did, but God was the ultimate one who sent me through your acts to bring about something far greater than your eyes can even see. And so Joseph, in this moment, he's choosing to view his life not through the lens of his circumstances. He's choosing to view his life through the lens of God. One will lead to bitterness. The other will lead to mercy. And this is what Joseph has done. He's granted them forgiveness here. And I mentioned last week two things that helped bring Joseph to this point. How are you able to forgive after all this time? I can tell you what might come out of my mouth after 20 years if I'm led by the flesh and given the opportunity. What is it that leads somebody to forgive somebody who doesn't deserve it? Two things we've seen in Joseph's life. The experience, the personal experience he had with the presence of God and the personal understanding he's now gained in the providence of God. These two things serve to soften his heart. It's the experience of God. Joseph didn't allow all these events to drive him away from God. Joseph allowed all these events to drive him to God. And as a result, he found that in everything that he went through in these sufferings, God was with him. God hasn't forsaken him. The power of God's presence was with him to heal him, to minister to him, to let him know you're not alone, to let him know this is not going to be the end, to let him know that your suffering's not in vain, to let him know I got you. And at the same time, and, and by the way, just know this, that old phrase, time heals all, all wounds, it's a lie. Time alone is not what heals all wounds. Time in the presence of God is what heals your wounds. God is the great healer. And if you will lean into him rather than run from him, then he can heal those wounds. He can soften that heart. And then combined with that, this understanding of the providence of God, Joseph began to see over time that God had a greater purpose in this thing. This, he wasn't zeroed in on the atrocity, as awful as it is. He's backing up and grabbing that panoramic view and going, oh, I only had 20 minutes in a two-hour movie and I only had that 20 minutes at the beginning and it looked bad, but now I see the whole two hours and I'm like, the author and director of this thing had something else in mind. And oh, is it glorious. It's so glorious, it makes my suffering pale in comparison to the glory that has now been revealed. And he, he reveals that to his brothers in verse six. He says, look at what God did through what you did. Look, what, look at God. He says, for the famine has been in the land these last two years. They knew it. That's why they're down there. And yet, brothers, there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. This famine has only begun. It is about to get worse. Everybody's going to die. And so God sent me, verse 7, before you in order to preserve for you a remnant on earth. 
and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here. It was God. He made me a father to Pharaoh, a lord in all his house, ruler over all the land of Egypt. You see what he's doing here. The fact is, God, he's telling him, has used your failures and he's used this famine in order to preserve life. Put it this way. If Joseph isn't betrayed by his brothers, he won't be down in Egypt. If Joseph isn't in Egypt, he's not gonna be there to interpret Pharaoh's dreams about the famine that's coming upon all the earth at that time. If Joseph doesn't interpret those dreams, he's never gonna get elevated to prince. If he doesn't get elevated to prince, then there's gonna be no plan for the nations. And if there's no plan for the nations, then everybody's gonna perish. And not only if everybody's gonna perish, Jacob and his family is gonna perish. And if Jacob and his family perishes, then so perishes the promise of God to bring about a savior in whom all the nations are gonna be blessed. Joseph has reverse engineered this thing in God's providence. Four times in this narrative, Joseph emphatically says, it wasn't you, it was God. He had a purpose in this thing that you couldn't see and I couldn't see. You sold me, but he sent me. Church, please don't miss this. The theological understanding of the sovereignty and providence of God is not just a nerdy doctrine for reformed people so they can geek out over it. The sovereignty and the promise of God as, and the providence of God as revealed in Scripture is put there by God to bring us comfort and hope like a balm to the soul in the midst of adversity. And it's also there as a key to unlock bitterness. If you don't have a greater framework about what God is up to in this world, spend 20 minutes on CNN and you will lead to despair and bitterness towards humanity. But if you can back up and see that God is playing the long game on this thing, even through our own human violence and sinful actions, which will be held accountable, which will receive his justice. But if you can back up and see the bigger picture, it won't lead you to despair, it'll lead you to hope, and it'll soften your heart to extend a grace to an undeserving enemy that you don't wanna give it to, so that God can fulfill his greater purposes. I remember, Um, A family I ministered to, uh, when my daughter was in first grade, she had a classmate um, up in Flower Mound uh, who died in a dentist office uh, due to a reaction to the anesthesia. It was a horrific, horrific loss. Did the funeral for this young boy, this first grade boy. The entire class came to the funeral. And the parents, as you can imagine, they're weeping uncontrollably. So many questions for them about God, so many questions for them about, you know, how this happened and what could they have done to prevent it. I mean, all the cycles that you would go through. And as a pastor, I know the very first thing people need, they don't need me to sit there and spout theology to them. The very first thing they need is the ministry of presence. They just need to sit in the ashes of pain and weep with those who weep. But I also know that eventually they need an answer. They're asking for an answer. And in, in processing with his family, you know, I shared with the dad who was really taking it personal that he was self-hatred, that he wished he had done more. And I was just recounting to him the story of Job, how Job was a righteous man, and yet even he lost tragically so much. And Job confessed in Job 14.5 that God and God alone is the one who has appointed the day of our death, and no man can exceed it. As I shared that with him, I'm sharing about the sovereignty of God. And I know there's a lot of questions. We have an enigma with that. Well, what about, what if I do this? Or what if I took this? Does that, uh, that? At the end of the day, God knows the day that we're gonna die. And that day is fixed. And there is, there is an understanding of God's sovereignty in that. It was years later that that man called me. And he said, I want you to know in all the struggles of grief and cycles we went through, the one thing I kept going back to is Job 14.5 because it reinforced to me that my life is not a runaway train with nobody conducting at the wheel. 
that there is a God who is sovereignly reigning over all of this. And I know he's good. And so I can trust him. Joseph can forgive these brothers, not because he excuses their sin, but because he has met with the living God who causes all things to work together for the good for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. So their debt, according to Joseph, is canceled. And the next thing you go, okay, so if Joseph has forgiven them, on their end, what do you do with this good news? When you know you deserved execution for what you've done, you know you at least deserve imprisonment, and yet all that has been forgiven. What do you do with this good news? Well, I tell you one thing, it's not to sit and soak in shame with it, but out of a new liberated joy, it is to go tell the rest of the family this good news so that they can live and not die. And that is exactly what you see. Look at verse nine. Joseph says to them, hurry now, go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all of Egypt. Come down to me and do not tarry. Go tell him the good news so he can get over here and live. In verse 10, notice the great provision that is gonna come for God's people if they'll embrace this good news and receive it. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen. Goshen is like this rich, plush land. You're gonna see it on repeat next week a bunch of times. The Goshen was like living in this untouched, plentiful land that was surrounded by famine in Egypt. It was nourished by that Nile River. It is beautiful. It's the most prized piece of land in all of Egypt. And they're gonna get to come live there. But he says, go, Uh, you're gonna come down. You'll live in the land of Goshen. You're gonna be near me. Your children and your children's children, your flocks, your herds, all that you have, man, we're all gonna raise them together. There I'm gonna provide for you. For there are yet five years of famine to come so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. So now come with your eyes, um, see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father of all my honor in Egypt and that all that you have seen, hurry and bring my father down here. So you see the power of forgiveness and not just forgiveness, but what provision is going to look like if you'll receive this good news and trust in this, this is going to be salvation for you and the whole family. And you will dwell in this land and you will be blessed. Come. Now we've seen that power of forgiveness. I want you to notice now the power of reconciliation that follows. See this in verse 14. And then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and he wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. After that, his brothers talked with him. John Calvin said of this text, by the way, right here, when Joseph reflects that their wickedness had been overruled by the wonderful and unmerited goodness of God, Forgetting all injury that he received, he now kindly embraces the men whose very dishonor God had covered with his grace. God has done all of this and God has forgiven you. How can I not forgive you? And here Joseph's kiss and his conversation with his brothers, you can only imagine how much they had to catch up on. It seals their reconciliation. So that's what reconciliation is. Reconciliation is two former enemies, two alienated parties that have been estranged and now being brought back together in right relationship with one another. Now, in order for that to happen, um, forgiveness doesn't automatically grant reconciliation. Reconciliation involves both parties. There needs to be an ownership of guilt by the party who did the offending There needs to be a confession with that. There needs to be true repentance where one turns from their sin, makes restitution if there's any that's needed there. And then the offended party has to grant forgiveness and cancel those debts. And then they can move towards one another in a restored and reconciled relationship that's gonna take time to do so, but it can happen. 
Now, that's not always guaranteed. You can forgive somebody, and we are commanded to forgive, but it doesn't mean there'll be reconciliation. The other party may not move forward towards in repentance. I'll tell you one of uh, the stories for me. Um, I've shared it in different ways up here, but you know, my dad left my family when I was three years old. He had an affair with his secretary. He took off and abandoned his wife and his three sons. When we were living up in Chicago, my mom moved us back home to Texas where I was raised here by my mom and then eventually stepfather. I went the next 30 years without ever having a single conversation with my dad about the affair, about him leaving us. I just visited him one or two times a year. He would take me to nice places and we'd just act like there was no problem. It wasn't reconciliation, it wasn't repentance, and there wasn't forgiveness on my end. It was just faking it. 30 years in, I've now got my own children And I'm going through a study that's talking about the need to reconcile with those in your life. And um, I've also, at that time, my firstborn daughter was three years old. She was the exact same age as I was when my dad left us. And I'd be impressed in this study. Hey, I think you need to forgive your dad. And I'm going, "Uh, hey, I don't think so. I'm looking at my three-year-old daughter. I'm going, how could you leave her? I could never leave her. How would you leave me? I don't want to forgive him. The leader that says, like, just pray about it, you know, ask him, like, yeah, I'll pray about it. Um, I don't have time, crazy set of circumstances, this big blow up happened in our family. And I just asked my dad almost spontaneously in this moment over email, hey, dad, we have never talked about what happened 30 years ago. Would you be willing to fly down here and meet? with me and my brothers, and let's just talk about this for the very first time. I hit send, and then I wet myself, and I thought, oh, gosh, what did I do? And then my dad responded, said, yeah, I'd be willing to. And I was like, whoa. So my dad flew in. We sat in this room, and it 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 felt like a tribunal. It was my three brothers, my brothers and I, and then my dad on the couch. And And it was all playing out. My oldest brother was the oldest when he left. He was around 12 years old, so he's just filled with anger and dumping out. I mean, my middle brother was nine years old when he left. He was just confused, had uh, drug addictions and all kinds of stuff that just kind of showed up and is hurt. We tried to numb out the pain. And then there's me. And all I could think of to tell my dad as I walk through, dad, here are the, here's a list of the things that you, that you missed out on in my growing up. And more importantly, that I missed you on. Like you weren't there for you know, my first date. You weren't, you weren't there, the birth of my child. Um, and just all these things. And I just said, I just want you to know, I just missed you. And I just want you to know, as angry as I have been at you, Jesus Christ has forgiven me. My sin towards Jesus was far worse than anything you could have ever done to me and my brother's. And he has canceled out my debt and forgive me. And I just want you to know, I forgive you. I am laying it down. I am canceling the debt. You don't owe me anything more. I love you. And I forgive you. Now, I wish I could tell you that my dad responded in I'm sorry and repentance and and then we went out and went fishing the rest of the day in a father and son camping trip or something. It's not how it went. My dad never apologized. He said, the only regret I have is I wish that your stepmother was your biological mother. I was like, yeah, that doesn't help, Dad. I'm not really what I want to hear. So in that case, there wasn't reconciliation, but I, I can tell you this. The forgiveness that I felt from my dad in that moment, it wasn't freeing him from his prison. It was freeing me from mine. And I can tell you before God, out of the abundance of forgiveness that Jesus Christ gave me unmerited, I was able to extend it. I couldn't have done it on my own. I was able to extend it to my dad and it liberated me. There's so much power in forgiveness. In this story, there is reconciliation though. Repentance has taken place, forgiveness has been granted and now there's a move towards one another and renewed trust and a restoration of relationship and watch the grace upon grace that flows now. Verse 16 and following, when the report was heard in Pharaoh's house, Joseph's brothers 
have come, it pleased Pharaoh and his servants. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, say to your brothers, do this, load your beasts and go back to the land of Canaan. Take your father and your households and come to me and I will give you the best of the land of Egypt and you shall eat off the fat of the land. And you, Joseph, are commanded to say this, do this, take wagons from the land of Egypt for your little ones and your wives and bring your father and come. Have no concern for your goods, leave everything there for the best of all the land of Egypt is gonna be yours. And the sons of Israel did so. And Joseph gave them wagons according to the command of Pharaoh and gave them provisions for the journey. Listen to this, verse 22. To each of them, he gave a change of clothes. But to Benjamin, he gave 300 shekels of silver and five changes of clothes. To his father, he sent as follows, 10 donkeys loaded with good things of Egypt, 10 female donkeys loaded with grain, bread, and provision for his father on the journey. And then he sent his brothers away. And as they departed, he said to them, do not quarrel on the way. What we have here is God's abundant blessing and grace poured out on his people. What God promised Abraham is now becoming true. Those whom bless you, I will bless. You're gonna be a blessing to the nations. Joseph is the fulfillment of this in many ways right here. And I want you to notice the numbers given here. Remember last week, Benjamin was given five times the portion of food than all the other brothers got. Now, He's given 300 shekels of silver, 300 shekels of silver. It's 15 times the amount of silver that, he, that Joseph was traded for. And, and then notice, remember how this whole thing got started. It got started because Joseph's brothers were jealous over the garment that he had. Well, now Benjamin gets five times the amount of garments. This is all on purpose. It's all division of five. The number five in the Bible is the number of blessing and grace. And every time you see a multiplication of five in the scriptures, it is an indication of grace upon grace, as John tells us in John chapter one. And notice even Joseph's final words to his brothers at the end of verse 24 is an evidence of grace. He says, do not quarrel on your way home. Why does he say that? Because he knows what the temptation is. What's the temptation gonna be for these brothers the moment they leave Joseph's presence? They're gonna start finger pointing. Reuben's gonna be, I told you guys, we shouldn't have done it. And Judah's gonna go, I can't believe I did it. And they're gonna all of a sudden, you're gonna have finger pointing. You're gonna have, I told you so's, guilt trips, shame sandwiches. And Joseph says, no. Brothers, it's finished. There is now no more condemnation, none. If I have forgiven you, then the debt has been paid. Don't fight with each other, walk in grace. And you know, I think some of us need to hear that too this morning, that God's grace is sufficient for you, for you who have committed sins, to know that his grace is sufficient for you, to know that you, You can quit beating yourself up in Christ Jesus. You can quit going in for the kill on yourself. The punishment for your sin has been exhausted in Jesus Christ on the cross. It has been fully taken care of. There's not another 10% that you gotta carry. It's been lifted from you. And in the same way that Joseph is lifting the shame off his brothers, God's grace, if you are in Jesus Christ, has lifted that shame for you. David confessed in Psalm 32 that God not only forgave his sin, he forgave the guilt of his sin. He took off the weights. And you can take it off too because it's been taken off in Jesus Christ. Quit torturing yourself over it. If you have confessed your sin before Jesus Christ and repented of it, turned to him for his grace, then 1 John 1, 1.9 tells us, And he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sin, cleanse you of all unrighteousness. It is finished. There is now no condemnation 
for those who are in Christ Jesus. Walk in his grace. Verse 25, so they went up out of Egypt. They came to the land of Canaan to their father Jacob and they told him, Joseph is still alive and he is ruler over all the land of Egypt. And his heart became numb for he did not believe him. The news was just too good to be true. This is Jacob. He hasn't seen his son in over 20 years. Now you gotta imagine this, this news also came with a confession. Imagine how that went down. Uh, yeah, by the way, Joseph's alive. Good news, good news. Uh, he's second in command of Egypt. Greater news, awesome. We were the guys that brought him there, but hey, let's not pay too much time there. Let's move on. Things are good now, right? No, I mean, it had to come with a confession. That had to have been hard for his, their father to absorb. And he loves his son. He thought his son was dead. And now he just found out his son's alive. Oh my goodness, y'all. I can only imagine what that was like for him to take that in. In verse 27, 28, when they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said to them, when he saw the wagons that Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of their father was revived. And Israel said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. I will go and I will see him before I die. Let me just tell you right here, there is nothing that will revive your soul more than the message of a son who has been resurrected in order to bring you life. That news will preach all day long. Amen? Three things I think this text is pointing to. We'll close here. One of them I've already hit so hard in this series, I'm not gonna belabor it, but one of the things we're meant to see is the providence of God over sin and suffering. God's providence over this whole thing. We are meant to see what man meant for evil, God used for good. More on that, though, in the last chapter we'll see. The second two I want to spend a little bit more time on. Not only the providence of God over sin and suffering are we meant to see in this text, but secondly, the purpose of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ as it pertains to you and me. You cannot escape from the parallels between Joseph and the one who will come after him, Jesus Christ. This is just a movie trailer of all that is going to be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. This is just a shadow of the real substance that is gonna come in Jesus Christ. Listen to this and tell me if it sounds familiar about what Jesus Christ has done for you and me and the story of our redemption. Like Joseph's brothers whose sin put Joseph in slavery, it is our sin that put Jesus Christ on the cross. Like this story where Joseph confesses that what you meant for evil in me, God used for good in the same way, even though our sin was intended to be used as rebellion and evil towards the living God in rejecting him, it was God who intended it for his good all along. Just as Peter confessed in his two sermons in Acts chapter three and five, when he told the Jews, you're the one who put Jesus on the cross. But God in his foreordained plan ordained that he be there so that you could receive salvation in him. God has meant for good what man has meant for evil. Likewise, just as Joseph and now his brothers are able to see the master plan in all this, God's master plan in allowing one to suffer was ultimately so that an entire family could be preserved. Joseph going down into Egypt was to get one family in Canaan to be incubated down in Egypt so that they could grow and 430 years later, they're gonna give birth to an entire nation so that through them, a Messiah can come. In the same way, God allowed one man to suffer, Jesus Christ, on a cross so that he could preserve the life of an entire family, look around, called the church. Every tribe, tongue, and nation all across the earth, God is redeeming a family for himself. And in the fullness of time, the Spirit of God, just like with Joseph's brothers, allowed us to see our sin for what it was so that we could own that sin, own the guilt of that sin, and repent and turn to Jesus Christ for his mercy. 
And then God, in his kindness, revealed, unveiled himself to us through Jesus Christ so that we could identify who our Savior is, Jesus, resurrected from the dead. And then in doing so, Jesus did not hold our trespasses against us, but like Joseph, freely forgave us and cleansed us of all unrighteousness. And then he drew us near into his presence through adoption, in reconciliation, so that we can be with God for all eternity once again. In which in that moment, Jesus not only removes all of our sin, but in his presence, he removes the shame of our sin. So we don't have to carry it anymore. So we can be freed, so we can walk as forgiven saints, loved by God in his grace. And in doing so, he then fixes our eyes, not on our sin, but on his providential redemptive plan that overplays everything, leading towards the ultimate joy, which is to come when Christ returns. And in the meantime, what does he do? He bestows upon us all the blessings of the Goshen, all the blessings of the eternal treasures that are in the heavenly places, Paul said to the Ephesians. They're now ours in Christ Jesus. And then what does he do? After receiving all of that, he says, do not tarry. There is a world out there in the midst of famine right now, and if we don't go get the gospel to them, they're gonna die. So go and tell so that they may believe and live. And as we share that good news, as people receive it, their spirit is revived and they will now move towards their savior to receive the same mercy and grace that we've received. Is that not the good news of Jesus Christ? This is the good news, not just of Genesis. This is the good news of the gospel. This is not just the story about Joseph as savior. This is pointing us to the story of Jesus as savior. For anyone who would turn away from their sin, believe upon Jesus Christ, you can be forgiven and you can receive the blessing of his salvation and the, and the merits of Christ that are bestowed upon your account. That is the good news of the gospel. We are meant to see that in this. But in addition to seeing the purpose of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ, it goes even further than that. Thirdly, the third takeaway, the providence of God, the purpose of God, and now the power of God in forgiveness and reconciliation of others. In other words, if you and I have received the forgiveness and reconciliation in Jesus Christ, how can we not go give it away to others who need it as well? Listen to Paul's words to the Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and then gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. There's those two aspects of it there. There's the vertical, what we receive in Jesus Christ, and then there's the horizontal, us now being agents who go out on behalf of God and herald that message of reconciliation to those around us, which involves not just sharing the gospel so other people can be vertically reconciled, but for all those who are reconciled, it's also us reconciling with one another. Paul says in Ephesians chapter two, one of the great purposes of the gospel wasn't just to bring us to Christ, though it's true, but also to bring us to one another and a new family. Where else can you take former enemies alienated and hostile, Paul says in Ephesians 2, and bring them together and make them one new man, one new creation, only through the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, man, and I'm not saying they're bad things. They're all common graces God has put up we need to employ, but politics ain't gonna do this. Mercy ministries aren't even gonna do this. Nonprofits and social justice alone is not gonna do this. Only the work of Christ shed blood on the cross can bring two together and make them one. Only the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ can do that. And as a result, because the reason is, when you come by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, and not your works, then we don't have a play over one another. It doesn't matter what your religious background is. It doesn't matter your, your racial or ethnic background. It doesn't matter what your socioeconomic status is. We're all one. Why? Because we're all saved by grace. 
No one was more meritous than the other. No one can go, well, I earned it and you didn't. None of us earned it. And therefore, the playing field's level. It's one house, one family right here. And that's why Paul then tells in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, be kind to one another then. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Why? Just as God in Christ Jesus has forgiven you. So church, let me just ask, who in your life right now, maybe even who in our church right now, are you having a hard time forgiving? Is there anybody else in this room other than me who has a hard time forgiving people at times? Anybody? Two, three, y'all, great, we're on the same team. The rest of y'all will get there. Uh, What is it that holds us back? I know there's a lot of other circumstances. Oftentimes they say, well, it's because they haven't repented yet. Forgiveness has nothing to do right now with them repenting. Reconciliation will. Forgiveness actually has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with God. If God has canceled your debt when you did not deserve it, then how can we withhold forgiveness from someone else who has sinned against us? Romans 12, 18 says, as much as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. I would argue that if you're having a hard time forgiving somebody, just as I do, the answer to that is not to focus on the circumstances, not to focus on the behavior of the other person. It's actually for you to go look at the cross, for you to go sit under the fountain of God's grace and remember you who are once far off, he is brought near. He has canceled the debt. There is therefore now no condemnation for you who are in Christ Jesus. And so as Jesus prayed in Luke chapter 11, when he taught us to pray, Lord, forgive us our sins as we ourselves forgive those who have sinned or trespassed against us. May we be a forgiving people, bearing witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, Oh, how we need this message. It's a beautiful story. This is a story that is so powerful, God. And yet it's not a story just about Joseph and his brothers. It's a story about Jesus and us. It's a story about how you have forgiven us. And to much who has been forgiven, then we should be able to love much and forgive much. God, would you help us today? Help anyone in this room who's just wrestling with resentment and bitterness and anger. That is a prison unto ourselves. God, would you help us to remember the forgiveness of Jesus Christ that has freed us and liberated us, that we may go and tell, that we may go and minister that forgiveness to others who so desperately need it in a time of famine, in a time of death. May others experience the grace of Jesus Christ through us so that they too can turn to Jesus and receive his mercy. We pray this, God, for your glory. God, we pray it for our good. In Jesus' name, amen.